All right guys, Tyler down here at Emerald City Guitars with a pretty special video today. Uh, as you can see, we're back in the repair shop. This is where I spend most of my time. And uh, one of the things I do back here is vintage guitar authentication. So if you follow our shop closely, uh, you might know that we recently took in four original bursts. Uh, I speak, of course, of Gibson Les Paul standards built between 1958 and 1960 inclusively. Uh, they are consistently amongst the most expensive guitars ever and are one of the most often faked as well. So what I want to do today is kind of give you a quick idea of what that authentication process looks like back here. So let's get at it. Uh, we might as well just go stem to stern, start the headstock. So if you look really closely, you'll notice that the left hand horn, when you're looking at the front of the headstock, is just a little bit sharper than the right hand, and the dip that comes from the center of the headstock is a little bit more exaggerated as well. This is just how the templates were back in the day. They were all cut by hand, so they were small little sort of anomalies. And this is one of them. As you can see, the right hand in comparison is a little bit flatter and uh, terminates more at a 90 degree angle than an upward point. So a lot of guys who make copies will actually use modern templates that are dimensionally pretty correct, but they're all laser cut and perfectly symmetrical, so you won't see this uh, sort of weird dip over here. So these were cut on a router, but everything was finished by hand. So some are definitely more pronounced than others, but uh, it's something to keep an eye out for and it's always something that's good to see. So up at the top of the headstock, of course, is the Gibson logo. All these logos were cut by hand, so there will be a little bit of variance. One thing that often happened upon installation of these inlays is that it would crack, usually on either side of the S, where it's really, really thin. They, of course, were just repaired and glued in. They didn't throw them away. Uh, they used fish base glue, actually, to glue in the inlay that was dyed black, so it sort of acted as a filler. And another really common thing you'll see on the logo is the lacquer starting to flake over the top of the pearl. Uh, that's totally normal. So down between the tuners, we'll see the Les Paul silk screen. This is a silk screen on top of the finish, so the edges should be really, really defined. Um, no clear coat over it. This is in contrast, of course, to the serial number on the back of the headstock, which was stamped and then finished over. It is a 921 uh, serial number, and the 59s ran from the 903 to 932 serial numbers, so it's right in the middle towards the end of 1959. So the tuners, of course, should be single line Clusens. This means there'll be one stripe running down the center of the back of the case that reads Clusen Deluxe. These tulip tips should have one ring around the base. Uh, later in 60, they go to two rings. So in late 1958, Clusen was actually granted their design patent for these tuners. So Clusens made prior to late 1958 uh, would have a patent pending stamp underneath, uh, while these, after late 1958, uh, will have a patent number with the patent number stamp, as you can see. Uh, that's what these have and that's correct. So another good way to spot repro tuners is by looking at uh, the shaft hole in the case. If you get right in there you can see that the back side of the shaft uh, is retained by this little bushing. Uh, reissue tuners will have a uh, sort of white plastic bushing uh, whereas the originals it'll be a steel bushing. Uh, the originals did not have any internal plastic parts. So let's take a quick look at the nut. Uh, it's a pretty simple part. It should be 1 and 11 16 wide. Uh, the original nuts were not made of bone, they're actually made of nylon, just PA66. A good way to tell if the nut has been replaced or has been off is to just look at the seam sort of around the sides of the nut and back where it meets the headstock veneer to see if that finish has been broken. Uh, this doesn't look like this has been, so there's a really good chance this is an original nut. All right, so let's move down the neck and check out the inlays. Uh, of course, these are celluloid inlays. They do shrink a little bit laterally, but they don't really rot away like some other compositions of celluloid did. But this vintage inlay material has a really, really distinct look. Uh, it's very, very hard to copy, and these just look great. Another little known fact that it's pretty easy to gloss over is that the fretboard side dots on bursts are not actually black, they're a red tortoise shell. And uh, if you're just looking at it in normal light, it can be difficult to see, but once you get up there uh, with the flashlight, uh, it's very clear that they are actually tort, which these are. So relatively early in 1959, uh, the fret size changed on these bursts uh, from a pretty slim fret around 70 thousandths wide uh, to the larger jumbo fret, which are around 100 thousandths wide. These frets are the correct width. They look original. All the nubs are still there. Very, very consistent. Uh, so I think they're original frets. So let's check out the back of the neck. Uh, of course, it's the 59 Les Paul. It's the quintessential perfect neck profile to a lot of people. Uh, these were actually rough shaped on a shaper, but were later finished by hand on a belt sander. So there is a little bit of variance in profile, but this one's right down the middle. Every once in a while, you can see a little difference in the shape of the heel here, but this one, uh, this one's exactly what you want to see. But then again, it was finished by hand, so uh, it's very possible there can be discrepancies. 
All right, so let's make our way on down to the body. Uh, let's pull the strings off and check out the hardware. So we're down here at the body, and of course we have the quintessential Gibson ABR1 bridge. So there's no retainer wire for these saddles, which would be true until I think sometime in 1962. The bottom, of course, reads Gibson ABR1, and then has the foundry mark there. So you notice on this original that uh, the letters, as well as the foundry mark, are very, very sharp around the edges and flat across the top. So when you see reproductions that are maybe cast off the original, uh, you'll notice that these letters, as well as the foundry mark, are very round on top and the details aren't quite as crisp. So believe it or not, the Gibson historic reproductions are actually some of the best out there. The only way I really know how to tell the difference is by checking the thickness of this back wall. Uh, it's the uh, wall that retains the saddle on the side opposite of the fastener head. It's just a very, very slight difference in thickness. Uh, the originals tend to be a little bit thinner. They'll measure around 40 to 41 thousandths wide, whereas the reproductions will be anywhere from 46 to maybe 50 thousandths wide. So we'll get the caliper out here and we can see right at 41, so that's perfect. Another thing to note about these original ABR1s is when they're installed, they were angled much less severely than modern reproductions. Uh, they're almost parallel to the pickup here. While that's a good way to tell an original from a reproduction, uh, it can at times make it pretty difficult to intonate these original Les Pauls. So let's take a look at the stop tailpiece. Uh, they can be pretty tough to tell the difference between a repro and an original. A lot of people make really, really great repros, but there are a couple things that I always look for. The most common mistake I see on these reproductions uh, is in the string ball slot. Uh, back here you can see inside the slot itself is very, very rough. It hasn't been finished, whereas a lot of the repros are smooth just like the outer surfaces. Uh, another difference between the originals and the historics is that the countersinks themselves for the string balls back here in this slot tend to be just a little bit smaller than they are on the historic ones. But all in all, these aluminum castings were really, really rough. It requires a lot of hand finishing, as you can see on the bottom, a ton of hand filing. So you have to have a pretty sharp eye to tell the difference. One thing to check on these stop tails and all the nickel hardware is uh, just how it ages and make sure it ages evenly with the rest of the hardware. Nickel finished hardware tends to dull with age, as you can kind of see here, uh, whereas a chrome finish would uh, chip rather than sort of dull, as you can see. So as much as they vary, they are pretty consistent in weight. Uh, they seem to always be within a gram or so of 31 grams. So that's something you can test if you have a very accurate scale. All right, so let's take a quick look at the strap buttons. Uh, these are another thing that can be kind of tough to authenticate just because they were used on so many models for so many years in the exact same form. Uh, but there are a couple things that I look for. One thing I do always notice on the originals is that this conical sort of countersink section for the screw head is much more shallow than it is on modern reproductions. Uh, it facilitates the use of a bigger head of the screw, so that's always something I look for. But, you know, when you see enough of them, you kind of get an idea of what's real and what's not. Uh, the screw itself is important as well. These screws are always an inch and a half long in total length, uh, but only the bottom inch is threaded. So uh, if you see one that's threaded all the way up, uh, it most assuredly is a replacement. So let's take a quick look at the pick guard. Uh, it should be around 90 thousandths thick. One thing you'll notice right off the bat is that the area around the neck pickup uh, is pretty sloppily cut. Uh, the corners around the edges are uh, at a much looser radius than the pickup ring itself, and also down towards the tailpiece side, uh, it often fits really, really loose. So that's something to look for. So these original vintage guards, uh, where this bracket mounts here, uh, it's always over countersunk. The countersunk's much too deep, so this screw head sits well below the surface of the pick guard. A lot of reproductions have a perfect countersink where it sits flush. Uh, that's the right way to do it, but that's not how they did it back in the day, so that's a good way to tell. So we got the pick guard off, and there's a couple more things we can look for. Usually along these flat surfaces, like the side here and the back, we can see visible chatter marks, uh, just little sort of lines that are actually from the router when it was initially made. I know a few repro companies that do this, uh, but it is a good thing to look at anyway. Uh, then we flip it over, and this is something that I don't even think we can pick up on the camera, but uh, you can see very, very faint, but even uh, lateral lines that sort of run uh, orthogonal to the strings this way. There's rumors that they come from uh, the manufacturing process of these plastics when they were moved on a conveyor belt. Uh, I can neither confirm or deny that, but I do know that all the original burst guards I've ever seen have these very faint lines. So let's take a quick look at the body itself. Uh, the back should be one piece mahogany, uh, no center seam there. It's filled with contrasting grain filler, which is why the grain is so pronounced on the back. Uh, the top, of course, is a center seamed eastern maple top. 
Uh, not much flame on here, but uh, you can see a little bit in the right light. Something that's really indicative of eastern maple uh, are these sort of mineral deposits. You can see they kind of look like darker streaks. It's pretty distinct from the western variety of maple. So if the top seam on your burst is not centered, uh, it's very likely it's actually a refinished gold top. Uh, that's really one of the only ways to tell the difference uh, is that gold tops, I think, almost never were center seamed, whereas every burst was. But the seam is right on center. It's super tight. That's exactly what we want to see. So the contour of these tops were actually panographed but they were finished by hand, so there can be slight variance, but this is, I mean, this is just a perfect carve. It's quintessential. It's exactly what you want to see. So let's talk a little bit about the finish. Uh, that's another thing that can be kind of tricky. Uh, each finisher at Gibson kind of had their own methods and their own tricks. Uh, they did their own thing, and as long as it passed QC, it was good to go. Uh, a couple things to look for when you're looking for a refin uh, is around the edges on the binding. Uh, it should be nice and sharp. Uh, lots of times when you strip the finish, you'll sand it down and round off a lot of these fine details around the corners. On the insides of the cavities, uh, obviously you'll see some router fluff, uh, so to speak. It's good to look at that and just make sure the finish sprayed over that is consistent with the rest of the finish. That's a really good use of the black light to make sure that it's all glowing evenly. A couple things about the binding. The binding on these Les Pauls was scraped very, very, very well. You'll really, really rarely see any sort of errors around the binding area. So one really interesting thing we can see inside the cutaway here is this little sliver of maple that sits under the binding where the carve kind of takes it up and away from the maple top. Uh, on a lot of reproductions, you'll see people just leave the binding super, super thick and try to replicate that, but you can see the grain. Uh, this is in fact maple just like it should be. So these backs were actually cherry tinted. They're not stained into the wood themselves, uh, which can be really indicative in the wear pattern on the back. Uh, as you can see around some of these edges where it gets a little bit lighter pink, uh, that's something that would not happen if it was stained. Uh, so that's a really good sign. Uh, you can also see some of the tint every once in a while will leach into this ABS binding around the body. Um, that's also a very good sign, even if it wasn't an intentional thing. Another thing to look for on the backs is uh, when you take these control cavity covers off, the red, on the inside ledge of the cavities should be just a little bit darker than the rest of the back of the body. Of course, this is dependent on how much UV light has faded the back, but it's almost always noticeably darker. All right, so let's get her flipped over and get into the electronics. All right, so we're back here in the cavity. So the pots look really good. That's exactly what we wanna see. Uh, if I pulled the whole harness out, I could show you the uh, date codes. I'm not gonna do that. Uh, you'll have to take my word that they're in fact coded 134 907, which of course 134 is the code for Central Lab, 9 the last digit of the year, 1959, and the 07 meaning the seventh week of 1959. So that's right where we want to see them considering the huge batches in which Gibson bought these pots. So that is awesome. Of course we have our two original Sprague uh, bumblebee caps there. They have the correct little orange sleeves there to uh, insulate the cap wires from everything else. Solder joints look a little sloppy in areas, but that is it was totally normal for these bursts. Of course, we have the ground wire here flopping in the breeze like we often see. So one thing to keep an eye out for uh, and the wiring of these original Les Pauls is actually the braided wire itself. So if you look very closely at the individual strands of this braided wire, you'll notice that each individual strand is actually made up of two much, much smaller wires. So this is easily distinguished from modern reproduction wire because all the modern wire that I've ever seen uh, is actually three-stranded, meaning that those individual strands will be made up of three very, very small wires, as opposed to two on these originals. Uh, that's something that can very easily be overlooked, but uh, is a good thing to look forward to. Another thing you may notice looking at the back of the cavity is that it's not a flat bottom. It was actually routed in a sort of tilted jig uh, so the knobs can sit even on the top of the carve. So the knobs look much better from the front. As a result of that, uh, not all the edges of this cavity are square to the back. Uh, the most noticeable one is the, I guess, the most base side wall here. When looking at the cavity from the top, it's very easy to see that this top wall is at a huge angle. That's something that all bursts have. They were all routed on the same jig, and I very, very rarely see that on counterfeits. So now that we're back in this cavity, I might as well mention a very unpopular fact in the world of bursts. And that fact is that bursts are not 100% hide glue constructed. I know people don't like to hear this. People love hide glue. I love hide glue. You won't find a bigger hide glue fan than this guy. But the fact is that the tops were not glued on 
with hide glue. This is something I've never seen any counterfeiter get right. Uh, even the most famous guys, uh, Chris Derrick, Pete Baronet, the big guys have never ever got this right. So the reason that they didn't use high glue to glue these tops on is of course because it's water-based. It dries by evaporation. And when you glue a huge surface like the entire top of a Les Paul, it has to dry from the outside in, which on a joint of this size takes forever. And of course that is not conducive to a manufacturing setting. So what Gibson did back in the day is they used something called phenol formaldehyde resin. Uh, chemically, it's very, very similar to Bakelite, dries very hard, very crystalline. So Gibson would route this body uh, for this channel that goes all the way across prior to gluing the top on. They would slather up the top with phenol formaldehyde resin, uh, get it on there, get perfectly centered, clamp it up, and this is where the advantage of using this resin over high glue comes into place because whereas you have to wait for high glue to cure, Phenol formaldehyde is a thermoset plastic, meaning it's like epoxy, it cures with heat. So what they would do is get it all clamped up perfect and then blast the guitar with radio waves. It just kind of like putting something in your microwave. And these radio waves would heat up this phenol formaldehyde resin and cure it within a matter of minutes. Whereas if you're using hide glue, uh, it could take, I don't know, weeks to fully cure. So that's what they did and that's why they did it. So for years and years and years, people have denied this. Even the top guys in the field said, no way, there's no way they use multiple kind of glues in the manufacturing process. But due to this thing that I mentioned briefly earlier, this route that was uh, cut before the body was glued on, uh, we can prove that it is in fact not high glue. So when we look down on either side of this big channel, we look down in the channel, we can see uh, there's some squeeze out from when the top was glued on. Now, every once in a while, we get very lucky and a piece of that will have chipped off and be kind of bouncing around in the cavity. So whenever that happens, I always collect them and I have a couple of them here. So this lighter yellow piece here is dried hide glue. Uh, it's stuff I mixed up myself, obviously, because it's hide glue. It is extremely soluble in water and also will burn because it's protein based. Now, these two darker pieces are uh, what chipped off the inside of this channel. You can drop it in water for as long as you want. It's gonna stay just as hard and brittle as it is now. And if you try to light it on fire, uh, it will not burn. It'll just decompose and sort of break up. So that's a pretty infallible way to tell it is not in fact high glue. Maybe sometime down the road, we'll do a little hands-on experiment with this. But for now, you'll just have to take my word. It's not high glue and that's okay. They're still awesome. All right, so let's flip this around to the top. Talk a little bit about the switch tip. Um, these were made of catalin. Uh, they were made in similar forms uh, as far back as the 40s, uh, all the way up until I think 1960 or 1961 when the composition changed. These tips were provided by the same company that provided the switches, which is Switchcraft. So these exact switch tips were used on a ton of guitar brands uh, throughout that big window of time, as well as numerous non-guitar applications. So who knows how many of those are out there. Uh, it's pretty impossible to tell whether or not this was the original tip uh, that came with the guitar just because they're so easy to remove and put back on. But one way to tell if this is old or not, uh, we can kind of look at the shape. The domes on the reproductions tend to be a little bit flatter on the top and also smaller in diameter. If you look at the bottom threaded part here, the reproductions tend to have slightly thinner walls than the originals. Uh, but the one big deal breaker that I see most often on these reproductions is that there should be no mold marks. It's just a little ridge that you can hardly see. Uh, this is 100% wrong. If your switch tip has this, it's not original. None of the originals were like that. Uh, so another good test to tell whether or not this is Catalan or a modern plastic uh, is if you have a hot water pot, like I do over there, just give it a little dip for a couple of seconds and then smell it and it should smell like formaldehyde. So that's a good indication that it's Catalan and that it is in fact old. So now that we have the switch plate off, we can take a look at the jack. Uh, this is a Switchcraft jack. So the really telling part is this brown fibrous sort of wafer material that makes up the insulating portion of the jack. The new stuff is lighter and a little less porous uh, than the old stuff. This is much more orange as well, so it's pretty easy to tell. Looks like original solder joints. Uh, this is exactly what we want to see. So as you can see, this jack plate has pretty rounded corners. Uh, sometime in mid to late 59, they started transitioning to a jack plate with more sharp corners. Uh, so this is probably pretty late for this particular style of jack plate, but otherwise looks totally perfect. It's exactly what we want to see. All right, so last but not least, let's take a look at the PAFs. Or rather, they should be PAFs. We can actually tell a lot about these pickups by pulling off the covers. Uh, yeah, we're not going to do that. Uh, so we can just kind of go by what we see here. 
So on very, very early PAFs, like no sticker 57s, uh, you'd see a brushed stainless steel cover, but soon thereafter they change to a nickel plated brass, uh, which is of course what we see here, so that's good. So the PDFs that came in the hollow body models at the same time uh, were a little bit different in the neck position, they actually had narrower pull spacing, uh, 1 inch and 13 sixteenths rather than the 1 and 15 sixteenths that would come uh, in the bridge position of the hollow bodies as well as both positions of the Les Paul. So if you get our calipers out here we can see center to center we are right on 1 and 15 sixteenths so that's perfect. That's why so many vintage Birdlands and ES350s and L5s and Super 400s from the same time uh, will have switched out pickups on them. Uh, people rob them out of those and put them in their Les Pauls. Uh, even though they're not quite the same, they're usually always gold covered as well. Something else we can see from the top, just looking at the pull pieces, uh, not all of the slots are cut directly on center. You can see usually two to three of them on each pickup will be a little bit off to one side. So let's flip it over and we can see one big indicator is these L-shaped tool marks on the bottom of the feet. Um, that was just from the jig that they used to bend the base plates. So let's look a little bit at the PAF sticker. Good repro stickers are shockingly hard to find. Almost always the font of the repro stickers is way too fat and closely spaced together when compared to the original ones. Also the border around the original stickers is actually clear lacquer, not gold like on a lot of the repros. Uh, sometimes it can look kind of gold just because it's clear lacquer that had yellowed over time, uh, but it is clear and that's really easy to see under a black light as well. So something else that is almost always wrong in the repros is the spacing of the letters. Uh, one thing to look for is the first T in patent. If it's lined up directly above the E in applied, uh, it's most certainly a repro. Uh, the originals were not like that at all. Another thing you'll notice when you look closely is that uh, the gold font itself was silk screened with a pretty coarse screen, uh, so it can look a little bit porous and sort of bumpy, whereas a lot of the repro stickers are smooth in the lettering, almost like it's a foil. And like I said, when you we were talking about the controls, uh, this is the two strand braided wire uh, rather than the three strand uh, like modern wire. So yeah, that's just a few things to look for. As you can see, this cover's never been off, which is awesome. So as we put this pickup back in, we can take a look at a couple things. We see we have a long neck tenon here, which is exactly what we wanna see. Uh, also, similarly to the control cavity, uh, this neck pickup pocket was cut on a sort of slanted jig. So the side walls of this cavity uh, are completely perpendicular to the top. Yeah, so I think that's a pretty good start as far as taking a look at my authentication process. Uh, obviously, there's a ton more that we don't have time to get into. Maybe some stuff I'll go into uh, at a later date in some later videos if you guys are interested in it. In conclusion, I'd say if you're in the market for a burst, I strongly, strongly, strongly urge you to go to somebody who's seen a lot of them. I know there are plenty of guys out there who can talk the talk and they study up on the forums and on the online articles uh, and they sound very, very knowledgeable when really they have little or maybe even no experience uh, with hands-on with the burst. The fakes are so good. I mean, these are three, four, five hundred thousand dollar guitars. There's plenty of incentive uh, to make counterfeit guitars. There's already some really, really great counterfeits out there, and they're only getting better every day. So, my advice would be, even if it's not us, go to somebody who knows their stuff. Because I would hate to have you walk in the shop with your brand new burst, and you know, you have to be the one to tell you that it's not real. And that's not fun for anybody. But uh, in conclusion, thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we'll see you next time.